Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Wonder Grant presentation series. Really glad you're here. Um, I'm so excited for today's presentation with HPC Architecture. Um, they've really done some really great work that we're excited to get to today. But I do want to point out, if, you, if there's any way that you missed the last two presentations, you certainly will not want to uh, not go back and check those out. And so in, our, in, the, chat, uh, in the chat section of, of the Zoom today, um, there's going to be a link that's going to take you back to our website where you can see the research from the, from the uh, previous presentations and you'll be able to see the videos and the presentations themselves. And so we've captured those and I think you're really going to enjoy them. My name is Dave Bryant and I am uh, the Vice President of Sales at One Workplace. I'll be your moderator today. And again, as I said, we're really super excited to have HPC. Do want to say that the, the 2019 Wonder Grant uh, season was, was really phenomenal for us. We took a chance on an idea and, and, and piloted uh, this program. We're just really excited about what came out of it and, and HGA and the work that they did along with Holly Peterson Snyder. Um, and then today's work with HPC, we just couldn't be more proud of these firms, the work they did, and the conversations it's allowed to start happening, not just within um, their own business with their customers, but within the greater community. After all, our goal with Wonder Grant was to really um, encourage thought leadership in the architecture and design community and start to have dialogues and be able to fund research in a way that that, that in a lot of ways may not have happened if, if we didn't take the opportunity to, to make that investment. With that, I will uh, point you to the 2020 uh, Wonder Grant uh, program. We're super excited with, with how 2019 worked out and 2020 is just only encouraged us that even more. We doubled down on our investment in Wonder Grant and we're opening up um, the areas where Wonder Grant um, submissions can come from. So we really are encouraging uh, architecture and design firms in the San Francisco area, as well as continued in the greater South Bay market and all the way out to Sacramento to take advantage of this opportunity to apply for a grant, and really provide some points of view and thought leadership um, relative to our community. So we're really excited about that. You can see the link uh, here in the slide. And, and go to do those submissions. Those submissions and applications are due on July 22nd. And so uh, we wanna make sure that you take time, work together with your team. I think if you asked any of the presenters um, if what their experience was, I'll tell you it was transformational in their organization and, and even within their work. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and introduce our, uh, our, our guest today. Uh, before I do, I will say throughout the presentation, um, we want to encourage you to put uh, questions that you might have that may come up during the presentation because we will have a question and answer session at the very end. The Q&A session is a little bit of an afterglow. So if you're not able to stick around, your schedule doesn't allow that to stick around after 1230 for that um, or after, uh, after 12 o'clock for that, that you uh, will still be able to come back and, and watch the Q&A session at a later time, but throughout the presentation, please don't hesitate to put your Q and A's in, in that section of, of, the, uh, of the Zoom. So we will, uh, at this time, I wanna, I wanna introduce our guests. We have, we're proud to have HPC Architecture. They're our neighbor just right down the street here in the heart of Silicon Valley. Their team is led by um, a, a, a distinguished gentleman, Steve Cox, and uh, he's led a really great team, and I think you're really going to enjoy their presentation today and around technology. And uh, it's, a, it's a little different presentation than the last two. I think you're gonna really enjoy it. Um, they're going to be pre presenting on their exploration into the ability of immersive virt visual communication technologies, BIM, AR, VR, MR, and, and how it allows to turn the client engagement um, into clients being more partners uh, rather than just um, observers, and to include and improve the understanding and participation of the clients throughout the design process versus kind of traditional start, go, back up, start, go. Um, it's really interesting, and we really appreciate their approach. I think you are too. So, Steve, I'm going to hand over the reins to you. The floor is yours. 
So um, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, I trust that you're doing well during this challenging time. This morning, we're going to be talking about presentation techniques, as Dave said, and this is for architects and designers. So here's a question. Um, virtual reality, is it a cool tool or is it a design detour? Allow me to take a few minutes here to explain how we think about this in our firm. So what we do as architects and designers is always about communication. Well, let that sink in for a minute. If this is true, then in addition to being designers, we're also in the communication business. The challenge of designing a building or space for users has always been one of communication. How does the designer transform what they envision into various medium that will allow owners, users, approving authorities, lenders, and contractors to fully understand what's being proposed for construction? Think about this. Architecture is the only art form where the designer never physically creates the final product. The sculptor envisions the piece and then forms the clay in their, with their hands. The artist sees the image and then paints uh, or puts uh, paint to canvas. The musician composes the music and then plays the instrument. By contrast, the traditional architect completely relies on someone else's understanding of their design to physically implement the final building or space. So this has always required the best means of communication. So therefore, communication should be at the heart of what we do as designers. If a designer is unable to effectively communicate the, the uh, design intent, there is always going to be a disconnect between designer, client, and builder. So the decision as to which medium or tool to use has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. Heck, it's changed in the last 20 minutes. For centuries, designers have relied on the ability to draw as a means of communicating their design intent. Over the last two decades, there has been a dramatic shift toward other tools and software, replacing the need for pencil on paper. If architects are not careful in how they approach this shift, the technology may make it more about the tool and less about capturing and communicating the essence of the design. Think about that. In design and architecture, the drawing is never the final product. Instead, it's the tool or the means. The building or the space is the final product, and we can't ever forget that. Architecture and design should always be about the client and the user. Space and building should be programmed and designed to meet the required and intended uses. So with the advent of new architectural tools and presentation techniques, it's critical that designers Never forget the client while on that journey. CAD, virtual reality, augmented reality, and yes, even mixed reality are recognized as efficient tools for the designer to create and manipulate spatial design. Through an investment in time and equipment, many design firms have become proficient with these tools. As a result, experienced designers can now communicate faster and more efficiently with other skilled designers. And that's the issue. The critical aspect of this co uh, collaborative design experience is to ensure that the client is not overlooked as a participant in that process. And this can happen by assuming that the client has the same level of understanding of the medium being used as the designer, when in fact we know it would only be the rare client who's schooled in using the latest design tools. Therefore, the true issue to explore here is how to ensure the designer fully understands which tools best fit their client's level of communication skills. In other words, how do we maintain a, desi a designer's understanding of the client's project needs while simultaneously addressing their ability to fully comprehend the complexities of the design being presented? So this webinar is going to explore the various presentation options available to effectively connect a designer's intent with a client's understanding of their design in order to meet the project needs. So next up to do that is Brian Brown. Brian is a project manager at HPC 
and he's going to explain to you how we went about exploring these issues within our own firm. Enjoy. Thank you, Steve, and good morning to everyone. So in order to better understand how we came about to select this specific subject for our research project, we felt that it was important to provide some of the recent history and the background that had directly influenced the evolving design process that was already at work within our own firm. Just four short years ago, HPC had been working primarily with your standard software staples of AutoCAD and Photoshop products. Occasionally, one or two of our projects would present a rare opportunity to hire a third-party designer to help develop the fully rendered 3D visuals. However, the 3D aspects would quickly be lost as they would ultimately be presented via a selection of static 2D renderings for our client's use. While these were very effective in helping the client to visualize their project, it felt extremely limiting and even somewhat short-sighted in the long run. Uh, and so this became especially clear to us given the desire by our clients to make changes to these renderings only to be discouraged by the additional cost of having to go back and produce modified versions of those same renderings. And so we began to ask ourselves, is there a missed opportunity, design opportunity being uh, forgotten here and left behind? And this was one that we felt maybe we as communicators of design would clearly benefit from exploring. So therefore, HPC began to investigate what it would take for us to expand our services. And our goal was to see what we might be able to provide to our clients that could hopefully set us apart from other design firms out there. As luck would have it, we were soon presented with, a, with two well-timed opportunities that would provide us with a pretty clear answer to that question. So our first unique opportunity came to us in early 2017. And it provided us a chance to learn a new tool that we had never used before, a tool called Revit. This was made possible through state-funded Revit training courses that were provided collectively to local architecture firms in California. So after completing the, that program in about six months, we now had a staff that was trained to a working understanding for one of the most powerful modeling tools available to designers today. At the same time that this was occurring, we learned of a technique that would allow us to pair Revit's 360 rendering capabilities with low-cost VR viewers. And this method excited us quite a bit because we saw it would allow us to actually bring our clients into a virtual version, version of their space before anything had ever been permitted or even constructed. Uh, so we began to explore how could we provide multiple of these 3D views in succession uh, thereby giving the client the ability to explore their space. And it was this curiosity that led us to our second unique opportunity, which was to work with a company called Yulio. As an emerging company for online hosting of 360 rendered views, they had expressed a desire to work directly with us uh, as an early adopter of their platform. So over the course of many months, we had established a working dialogue with them to kind of help adapt and refine their UI platform in order to fit the needs that we were encountering during our presentations to our clients as designers. So with these new tools now at our disposal, we started to develop a new presentation method which would actually take our clients into that 3D space. And the response was one of amazement and excitement from some of our clients. And we felt that we now had a new service that would be applicable to all of our clients. However, we quickly discovered that not all client expectations are created equal. Some of the clients we presented our 3D headset to would either be hesitant, unimpressed, or would even flat out refuse to try the thing on. Simply put, they weren't interested in the tool and they felt that it was an unnecessary distraction from the plans that they wanted us to get back to. So we began to ask ourselves, why the dichotomy of reactions to something that was far more immersive than two-dimensional plans could possibly hope to be? Could it have been due to the newness of the technology? Was it a fear of motion sickness? Uh, perhaps they were afraid they were gonna fall and embarrass themselves? We were forced to go back to the drawing board and take a second look at what we might be missing. And so it was at this moment that we were approached to take part in the Wonder Grant program and we saw yet another unique opportunity to fully immerse ourselves into helping to answer this question once and for all. And what we ultimately discovered is that our client's method of communication 
is as varied and different as the types of buildings and projects that we deal with on a daily basis in our profession. So our research task had now become clear, develop a method that to determine the right presentation tool for the right client. So to tell you more about our research findings, I'd like to now hand this over to Jeremy Metz. Jeremy's an associate project, associate and the project architect of HPC. And he's been instrumental in helping us throughout the evolution of this design process. So Jeremy, I'll hand it over to you. Excellent, thank you, Brian. So Steve helped us define the problem. The problem is communication. Brian has gone into the history of HPC and where we've been and the technology that we're using and, and how we get to where we're at now. My focus is really on the people, right? We all know as architects and designers, you gotta know your audience, right? You have to figure out who they are so we can cater to the presentation to the people. So, you know, it's, it's really figuring out who they are. So we've done this already for a few years, as Brian mentioned, we've done this probably three or four years now. And we've started to realize that if we can keep the conference room down in size, keep it to you know, four to six people, people feel more, uh, more flexible and, and you know, willing to try new things. And the other thing is it's easier for us to help sort of coach them in, into the technology. The other thing that we found has been pretty helpful is having lots of gear on the table. Have several, you know, have a Google Cardboard, have Oculus Go, have different types of headsets, all available there, queued up, ready to go. And people feel pretty flexible in trying it on. Oh, look, John's got one on. I can put one on too. You know, it's like, it's, they feel comfortable about it. So those are a couple of things that we've done to loosen up the room, to say. So let's talk about the people a little bit. So it's hard to sort of figure out who we got in the room, right? So what we've done is we've come up with four whimsical characters, little, little characters that, where we can sort of define who people are and then cater the design or the presentation to the person. So here are the four characters. The first one, Stubborn Stanley, okay? This is the person that, uh, you probably know them, they're, they're comfortable with a roll of drawings, you know, maybe with a calculator and a conference table and, and, and they're good, you know, they don't, they don't want to get into the technology. They don't want to try new things. You know, they've got their flip phone. They're happy with that. Oh, wait, hold on. My beeper's going off. You, you, know, you know that person, right? They're, they're fine with the old, the old way. That's Stubborn Stanley. The second one is Adventurous Alley. Okay. Adventurous Alley is somebody that's eager to try new things, high energy. You know, they're willing to sort of, uh, you know, go out there and really express themselves. They're the, you know, the, the life of the crowd, you know, Adventurous Alley. The third one is called Deep Dive Dave, all right? Deep Dive Dave. This is the person that's into the details, right? They wanna know how the soffit and the wall connect. They wanna see that detail. They wanna know how the awning hits the window and if the shade is getting into the room or what. You know, this is Deep Dive Dave, somebody who's in the details. The fourth and last one is Ninja Ned, yeah? Ninja Ned, that's the gamer, okay? This is the one who knows all the keyboard shortcuts. They're comfortable with technology. They got a lot of experience with the VR goggles. You know, that's, that's the Ninja Ned, right? They're the ones that says, give me the wheel and get out of the way, Jeremy. You know, that's Ninja Ned. So we got four whimsical characters and we also have four presentation types. So this is where we get into the meat of it here. Four presentation types. The first one, is railroad. The second one, anchored, teleport, and carpool. So we've got a we've got a short video here. It's about five minutes long. It's going to go through each of these these presentations. And if you're experiencing any sort of playback issues, we're going to post this on the on One Workways website, and you can watch the whole video, you know, frame by frame. You'll be able to catch it all. So hopefully there's no lag for you. But buckle in for now. Let's let's. Play the role here. Our first presentation method is called Railroad. While Railroad can be an acceptable presentation method for all client types, it is particularly suited for the stubborn Stanley personality. Railroad allows a client to experience a space as if they are watching it through the window of a train. The camera follows a fixed path through the building, 
bringing clients along to see the most important highlights of their future space. This presentation method uses a comfortable and familiar medium, allowing designers to easily present to a group of any size. Railroad ultimately helps clients understand the flow of their space in a way that's easy for them to understand. Up next is the anchored presentation method. This option is suited to a wider variety of client types and has proven most successful with the adventurous Alley and Deep Dive Dave personalities. This experience immerses a client further within their project. Although they are anchored to one location at a time, they have complete freedom to see the full 360 degrees around their vantage point. This lets clients carefully review the details of their project, including room layout, finishes, cabinetry, furniture, and much more. The architect is also able to observe what the client sees in real time, allowing for a collaborative session between designer and user. This experience enables participants to spend as much time as they like in each space and with hotspots within the model, choose where they want to go next. If the client wishes, this experience can also be shared with other members of a client's team to be viewed on their own time using their own personal headsets. Our next method is called teleport and is our most advanced virtual reality presentation method that we have developed. As the controls and technology requires some user orientation, we have found this method to be the most successful with the Deep Dive Dave and Ninja Ned personality types. Teleport completely immerses a client inside of their space with the latest cutting edge powers of virtual reality technology. Like the Anchored experience, the headset allows a client to look wherever they wish, but Teleport adds unrestricted movement within the space, so users can inspect details up close or grasp how one space leads to another long before their building is ever constructed. This freedom of movement gives clients an unparalleled understanding of their project. Participants can physically walk through their building or they can jump from place to place through a point and click transport method. This method also gives clients and designers the ability to modify a design in real time, allowing for the client's immediate and critical feedback to design solutions. Now, achieving a client's picture-perfect design is easier than ever. Our last method is called carpool, and as the name implies, this method lets us bring the entire team along for the same journey. Come along for the ride with carpool and watch your space unfold before your eyes. This experience leaves the driving to the designer and serves as a real-time guided tour between the architect and the client. As the architect navigates through a future space, a client is free to focus on the content of their design and lets them give real-time feedback to the experience. This flexibility enables users to inspect elements up close or gets a bird's eye view of the project. As with Teleport, Carpool also has the ability to see different design options within the experience and allows the team to discuss in a fully collaborative environment. With Carpool, the collaborative journey through a client's design need is now as easy as looking out a window. Well, thanks, Brian and Jeremy. So did anyone see themselves in any of those profiles? To be honest, over the years, I have probably moved through all four of those myself. So you may have noticed we haven't mentioned very, we've mentioned very little about any specific software or hardware. A couple of names came up, but we didn't really dive into the hardware and software. 
This was strategic because they wanted this to be about communication in our clients. And also, this is Silicon Valley, and in the length of time we've been in this presentation, the software and hardware probably changed at least once. In fact, there is a ton of software and hardware involved in this, and we do discuss it in our written report, which will be reposted on the One Workplace website. You may be surprised that the cost is not astronomical if you do your homework. So we talk about the price, we talk about what we used and how we used it, what worked and what didn't work in this written report. So in wrapping this up, we wanted to leave you with, a, with some conclusions or some, some takeaways. The first one is, um, number one, to assess the client's ability to understand the software presentation style. We did this by creating a game for them to play using one of the tools. And by doing this, we were able to gauge their level of understanding. And at the same time, the game helped introduce them to the, the, the tricks of the tool and the technology and how to move about, where to look, and so forth. So, uh, very helpful to assess a client's ability. Number two, to match the presents, uh, presentation style to the client's ability. That just that falls out of uh, item number one there. Number three, to create an orientation on-ramp to properly coach and orient. We found that if clients and users were properly coached and oriented, the use of these tools can be an invaluable communication uh, tool for us as designers. Number four, exposure uh, increases a client's uh, capacity to make informed decisions. We want the client to be a, a, a part of this design process. Yes, we're the designers, but we need their input, so therefore they need to understand what it is we're doing. So the more times a client or a user is exposed to the use of the tool, the value of their input increases. So you're, we're able to move people from one style of presentation up to another as they learn the tool. So the more familiar they become with the use of the tool, the more they value the service this provides, and that allows us to monetize it. So providing clients a shopping list of services allows them to choose the level of service, and as they see the value of each level, they often want to move to the next one. And then there's just some practical takeaways. Uh, number five, disorientation can occur in the walkthrough function. In that teleport style that we have, it's possible to, to actually walk through the space, but it's very disorienting with some clients. Um, so we noticed that and uh, we suggest that they use this, that teleport function that allows them to jump from one place to another and not, and not walk through it. It's still there, but we encourage them to use the, um, the jump mode uh, to, to help with the disorientation. Number six, multiple goggles allows for a group experience and lessens the resistance to using the tool. Jeremy talked about having the technology on the table, multiple devices. Um, the um, feeling of being singled out is eliminated. When there was just one device, the focus was on that person and people were reluctant to do it because they didn't want to feel foolish. Um, number seven, and this fits right into where we are right now, these paper hygienic masks for all users tends to lessen the resistance of some uh, it, to use of the technology. Now this was before we got into COVID. So prior to that, we were, we'd wipe down each mask and then we'd give them this paper mask to put on to make it a little more um, hygienic. Um, now, uh, we send clients a set of goggles that they can slip their cell phones into. They're not very expensive. Basically, they arrive, client can slip the cell phone into it, and they're able to watch remotely uh, railroad anchored and carpool. The uh, teleport function requires a specific set of goggles that are very specialized. Um, number eight, a portable router allows for better connectivity, uh, particularly when working remotely and off-site with a laptop. There's a lot of technology here, so whatever you can, whatever you can do to help uh, minimize that uh, is, is, is a great asset or great, uh, it helps immensely. Um, and finally, in our opinion, virtual reality outweighs traditional presentation techniques 
but clients must be properly assessed and oriented to the appropriate tool. So uh, that sort of wraps up the presentation. I'd like to just have some really quick thank yous here. The One Workplace, uh, One Workplace and the Ferrari family, what a tremendous support they were to, uh, to this whole process. Thank you again for the opportunity to both. Um, the staff at One Workplace, uh, Dave, Amy, Teresa, and Kelly, uh, great support. Thank them as well. The seven entities or companies that were our focus groups, uh, we uh, had some fun with these people and got to watch how they played with the equipment. And uh, it allowed us to learn a lot by asking them questions and seeing their reaction. And then uh, also the, just the staff at HPC Architecture, Dave used the word transformative. And uh, this process for us has been transformative for us as a team. Everybody played a part and I wanna thank them as well. And a very special thanks to John San Giovanni, uh, the founder and CEO of a company called Visual Vocal. John allowed us to just share where we were and what we were struggling with. And uh, he gave us very keen insights to some of the, the tougher things we struggled with. So John, thank you for your input. And then finally, Carolyn Clark Beadle, she is the Director of Audience Development at One Workplace. She was our coach. What a delight to work with. And uh, so CCB, thank you very, very much. We hope our presentation has been helpful and has provided you with a little different perspective on technology. And so with that, Dave, I'm going to turn it over to you. I believe you may have some questions for us. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, really appreciate you sharing uh, the, the technology in your journey. Um, I think one of the things that, that was that was interesting about the approach was was that you you weren't showing necessarily a new technology that didn't exist before. You're just showing how to use it appropriately, which which I think is exciting. We're obviously in a different time, and we didn't want any of the presentations. Well, the presentations for all the Wonder Grants were not necessarily geared around COVID nineteen, and I think a lot of us are appreciate at least one webinar that isn't all about that topic, but. Obviously, this can create, and you spoke a little bit to how you're sending things to some of your clients to still provide the, the experience uh, through, this, through this pandemic. Certainly work hasn't stopped. How has, how has COVID, though, maybe uh, validated or challenged your research? Is there something that, that had COVID happened before this that you might have uh, looked at differently, or, or how has it been validated? Yeah, I think I think for us, it's a matter of being in the right place at the right time. And we we happen to have this um, fully developed at the point that we went into uh, the shelter in place issue. And so we were able to begin to use it in a different way with with a different purpose than we'd started out with uh, by being able to provide clients this device they could use at home. And so it was always in the thought process, but now we had to jump into it and we were, we were prepared and the clients uh, found it was fantastic. They didn't have to come to the office. They could sit at home and, and see the same thing that we were seeing in the office with the, all the high tech stuff that we had around us. And it was really just a, it's a cardboard, it's a cardboard goggle and their cell phone slips into it. That's great. Um, Obviously, adding this to a project uh, when you have a client in the space, uh, either in your office or you're doing it remotely, requires some setup time. Um, have you been able to maybe capture how much additional time is required uh, to prep for this type of an experience with your client? Uh, and maybe what are you not doing now that you were doing before that may compensate for that? Um, I'll, I'll start and then I'm going to let uh, maybe Brian speak to this for a second. So um, um, the, um, and I was thinking about Brian, could you phrase the question one more time, David? Yeah. So uh, I guess the setup time, right? Um, yeah. Thank you. yeah. That's, that's, I got it. So um, the interesting thing for, for mo probably most of the audience uses Revit. And so, with what you do to create this 
3D Revit model, um, you know, the lion's share of the work is done in the course of doing the Revit model, which drives our plans and sections and elevations. And so the rendering aspect of it is really something that occurs afterwards. And it's not a, it's not a huge manpower um, uh, issue for us. It's really the, uh, the, the software, there's a cost to the software, that's where the expense is. But the labor cost, I think, has been less than we thought it was after the Revit model is in there. And yes, you put a little bit more into the Revit model. So Brian, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, so this was something we were challenged with in the very beginning of it because it kind of goes counterintuitive. Um, I don't know why my video is not being shared here, but uh, I'll keep talking. Uh, it's kind of counterintuitive to how we had traditionally been billing and, and, and loading up our proposals for our hours, where you would put most of your hours for your staff into construction document time rather than into design development. This required you to put it more towards the front design development to get the model made. Um, and I think this next statement here might help answer a few of the other questions I'm seeing here. Um, by having that done up front, it actually cut out a lot of our time that we would have experienced further down the road in CDs uh, because we were able to go through multiple design iterations right up front and get immediate feedback from a client that we would not have got maybe until even in construction in some cases. So we found that to be a very interesting takeaway from the entire process to say, if we can save a, a lion's share of hours at the end of this and a huge amount of headache and heartburn and everything and just put it all up front instead and just tweak how we build the, the, the proposal, uh, it actually works out to everyone's benefit, to the client, to the contractor, to especially the design team. Um, and it does require an investment of time to really make that model work in terms of not only the, the, the geometries that are involved, but also the finishes and everything else associated with that. Um, but the more you put into it, the more it pays back at the end of the day, because keep in mind, with something like Revit, you're able to cut all of your floor plans, your elevations, your, your details can be developed off of it. Um, and the rendering part, like Steve mentioned, uh, there's an investment in the software and potentially your hardware as well, but uh, we're not talking a gargantuan amount, we're talking a relatively minor amount. Um, and then it's really just, it's learning those tools and how to use them. And it all just kind of fed itself. And that's where we saw a real power that this is where I think it should go. Um, and we're kind of excited to see that's kind of where the industry is headed. Yeah, that's interesting. So it sounds like you see this as a competitive advantage for your firm. One, it sounds like it's, 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 it's uh, shortening the design process time and getting the customer engaged, which you, which you said earlier. Uh, but you, it's also something that, that is, a, is, a, is a competitive advantage. Um, how are you educating the customer through this process uh, about what they're going to experience or is it, so, is it something that not prepared, they're prepared for? And I guess that leads to a second question. Is it something that you charge additionally for? I mean, if, if they understand it's part of the process or, or they don't know and it's a, and it's a, new, uh, it's a new way of presenting, um, do you charge additionally for it and give them the option to have this or is this a part of your standard process that everybody gets? Yeah, so, we, um, thanks. Um, yeah, we, we, if you will, uh, part of the assessment is the testing. And so uh, we'll, we'll show the tool and we'll begin to introduce the client to it early, early on, again, to assess where their level of understanding is. Um, and so that's how we use the tool and introduce the tool. In terms of how we monetize it, um, it's, 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 it's different for the, for the first time client where we use the tool for the first time. There's this assessment and introduction. In re repeat work, it's easy to give them a shopping list to say, okay, you've seen what we can do. What would you like us to do on this next project? We have one particular client that we do repeat work with. And so we, inter we, we introduced the tool to him the first time, assessed his ability to understand it. He started at a fairly basic level. Rather quickly, we were able to move him up because he became familiar with it, moved him up, moved him up to now he's in the, like the teleport function, the most complicated one. 
it, this is where the lights went on for us. We realized he got into it. He was past the wow factor of the tool and he got into the details. He was beyond the tool. He was in the project. He was giving us feedback on colors and details and casework and, and stuff that just kind of blew us away, which we never would have gotten out of him before. But because we immersed him in the tool, took the time to train him and move him up, um, he now wants that. So when we give him a proposal for a project, we list the things we can do, put a value to it, and it's a shopping list for him. And he goes right to the top and said, I want it all. And the value for him is he can take it back to his lay staff. He's a facilities person. He can take it back to his lay staff now who aren't familiar with construction and design and he can show it to them and they understand what he tries to tell them is an interpretation of what we've told him. So yeah, that's the process. So you're clearly getting some efficiencies out of the process. Have you, uh, have you been able to quantify that yet? I mean, do you find that the process is 25% more efficient? Is it 5% more efficient? Is it more than that? Uh, Jeremy, you want to take that one? Yeah, thanks for th throwing me under the bus there. <laughs> uh, yeah, quantifying that's a little difficult. I, I can say that uh, it's the getting the immediate feedback. So we can where before we would send a rendering, get feedback and take a week, right? And you're just sitting there waiting as it cycles through the different departments. So if we can get them all in the room right away, you can cut, you can cut weeks out of the sort of design options and going back and forth. You got too many options. If they can just sit there, because we can make live changes. If they have, if they have the Oculus on, we can make live changes while they have the headset on and they can see it, poof, it changes, right? And they're able, we're able to cut a lot of time out and of course, for, for us, you know, time is our commodity. So it, it really depends on their, de their decision-making capabilities, but it certainly cuts out time, a lot of time. So you mentioned that you've had customers that, that you, you've done this with. What, what, is their, what has been their feedback? And Steve, it was interesting that it sounds like initially there's a wow factor and there's kind of the cool new tool but eventually they see the value of it. That's for a customer that you have an ongoing relationship with. When you have customers come in, what is their feedback? Obviously you guys are pretty pumped about this and, and you've really uncovered something that's meaningful for your business, the process, decision-making. What are your customers saying? So I, th I think maybe that's, you can answer it a couple of different ways. So let's say it's a, somebody we're meeting with for the first time. When we show them our portfolio, we'll show them, we'll show them examples of our work with, and we'll show them, we won't say this is a tool that we use or this is a tool that we have. We'll, show, we'll just show them the architecture and they'll recognize that it's a video or that they're walking through the video. And so it prompts a question which allows us to talk about the service. So it's a, at that level, it's a marketing tool. For other clients, to Brian's point, not all clients are created equal and they don't all want the same things. And so part of that assessment process with a client is not only understanding their, their willingness to use a tool, but their appreciation of the tool. And we're not gonna push the teleport thing, the most complex style on somebody who just wants to get a set of drawings and move on with their project. So it's, again, we're in the communication business and communication is about reading people and understanding where they are. And um, so it, it, it's, uh, it's just given us another tool in, the, I keep using the term tool, but that's what they are, they're tools. It's just a tool in the toolbox for us to use at the appropriate time. It's like anything in life. You use it when it works and you don't use the tool when it's not appropriate. So you mentioned that you've, you've done several of these and some customers can be, you know, on the ninja side and some of them can be pretty basic of, of all of the types. And I know all customers are different of all the types. Is there one particular presentation method that seems to be 
the gravitational pull for everybody? I mean, does, does is, is almost everybody, you're, you're doing railroad most of the time and you're really rare, rarely doing teleport or are you, is there somewhere in the middle that seems to be ground zero for most of your customers? Uh, Jeremy, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. So yeah, we've done dozens of these and it seems to me like the, the anchored one, that's the one that is really the, the easiest one for people to accept. And it's because it's what we could do is I just send a link to their phone. And nowadays it's, you know, if they're sitting at home, working from home, I literally send them a link to their phone and they click a button on their phone and they slide it into the headset. You know, it's sitting right here. And then, you know, it's just slide their phone right, right in that slot right there. And they go to town and I can see if I set up a session on the screen, I can see what they're seeing and they can look around and I, you know, we can talk about it and they even have the markup ability. So it, the anchored one is the one that's really most accepted and it's not that difficult to do. I mean, what we're talking about here before was, you know, a rendering. We had to do renderings anyway before, right? Everybody's got to do those now. And over the years, we've seen clients require more and more renderings. And by the time you've already built a Revit model, it's not that much work to get it from a rendering to this. It's really not that much work. That's, that's the that's tricky good. part. Uh, Brian, I've got a question for you. Um, we're talking about, we saw some great images, which was look like fairly fully built out environments. Uh, Brian, have you, have you seen a time where the space isn't fully built out and how do you use the tool or maybe everything's not finished, or or are you using it at all uh, in a pre-finished out space? How how what is that experience like, and and how do customers respond to that? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, well, we've used that a few times where it's not really a fully developed space. Uh, more often than not, it's about a medium level developed space, especially in the the schematic design phase for a project, um, where we're trying to really hone in what the what the project is going to look like. Um, more often than not, we'll use that for ourselves to understand the spaces better that we're creating. Um, that was the very interesting takeaway from all of this is that it actually helps us as designers to understand our own spaces in a way that maybe we didn't just going in simple traditional 2D uh, drafting techniques uh, through CAD and everything else. So it kind of forces us to find solutions to problems we never would have normally encountered. Um, we have that same kind of reaction if we present it to a client where it's not a really fully rendered environment. They're not really turned off by it per se. Um, we just let them know, just so you know, and this is a, a pretty, not, I don't want to use the word cartoony. It's a, it's a less formed version of your space and we're really in the early stages. They seem to be fine with it. Um, again, it's just kind of that, it's that coaching method with your client, having that communication, reading what their reaction is and managing their expectations. Great. So talk about managing expectations um are there times where the tool you, you're you're in the tool you're working with customers and and uh, you 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 think the team said it everything's great you sit down and realize man we 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 missed something here and how has the technology allowed you to get back on track no we never make mistakes we're perfect <laughs> <laughs> of course um, I will say uh, there, it, it's been valuable feedback, uh, and I would rather have that conversation earlier in the process than when I'm in construction administration out in the field uh, doing a site walk, and the client looks at this and says, I absolutely hate this. What have you done to me? Um, that's when I know I've, I've failed in that regard, and I've luckily never had that happen. Uh, I don't plan to, but uh, I would rather have that in a virtual environment than I would have that in the, in the real world. So... Um, I think Steve might have more that, that might be able to speak to that one. Yeah, I think as designers, the, the, I'll call it the in-house use of the tool, if that was part of your question, Dan. Um, it's always been said about architecture that God is in the details. <laughs> and um, for us to be able to sit around a monitor and look, just drill down into something in a 3D aspect and kind of fly around it and fly into it, um, is is such a time saver uh, from the old way we used to have to do it, where the the, desi the true designer had it in his head or her head, and and it was a it was how do you communicate that to those around you, be it a client or another designer, 
And this has allowed just this kind of stream of thought to occur uh, almost instantaneously so that people walk up to what you're doing, see it, and you've shown the condition and um, solutions come from that much, much more quickly than in the old style of doing stuff. So it's not just a presentation technique or tool. They're, these are design tools. And th that's the, it's, it, Revit goes from start to finish. In the finished final rendering, you saw there at one point where there was a window, a really simple window change. And so the operator made the change on the graphic, the client saw it, the window sill was raised up. What the client didn't realize was that behind the scenes, that changed the floor plan, elevation, sections, wall detail, it changed everything at one shot just by simply in the rendering, moving it up two feet. So. That's great. That's great. So I've got two more questions. Yeah. Um, the, the first one is uh, what, what, did, what did you discover through this process? What was the biggest discovery that going into it, you had an idea, you, you actually had done some pre-work even before this came in and, and when the Wonder Grant option became available to you, you, you knew exactly how you're going to go deeper on it. But what did you discover in the process that you didn't anticipate finding? Um, just the sensitivity to a client, and this this should have been real. This is really basic stuff, but it's the it's the understanding of a client's level to understand something. Um, so what we were experiencing prior to the the research was we were wowed by the tool, we loved the tool, and we wanted to take the new toy and show it to a client with the expectation that they would go as deeply into it as we did. And in fact, we were, I wouldn't say re repelling people, but we were turning them off. So it was the realization of these different levels of understanding, call it learning styles, if you will, graphic presentation learning um, from our clients and just being sensitive um, being just being sensitive to that and, and understanding how to work through those. And once you understand that, then you can move people up a level or two by knowing how to coach them. So I think Jeremy's worked on this too. So, so the, the one thing that was surprising, I didn't think we'd encounter is, you know, we're limited in the, the conference room that we're in the space, wherever you're doing the presentation, you're limited by the four walls that are around you. And so it might be better if the person with the goggles were outside, which is sort of counterintuitive. You really want them to be inside where you can see them, but they, it's better if they're outside. And if, if during the teleport, because you're able to walk around, and, but if the space that you're in isn't big enough and you want to go to the next room, you're, you're in this room, right? You, you can only go as far as the physical four walls will allow you to. And if you move around too much, you get dizzy. So that's why in our conclusions, we talked about really utilizing the point and the, the teleport method that takes you to the next room. You can physically walk there, but you have to be in a warehouse, a big open space that allows you the total freedom of movement, right? So that's, that was another, for me, it was you, after a while with the headset on, you do get dizzy if you're moving around too much. And I, I have something to add to that too. Um, Jeremy and I actually experienced a very interesting takeaway that we didn't expect. Uh, we had one of our clients that was actually part of our uh, research uh, grant here, and we were showing them their project. And there was one particular uh, element for an entry lobby, I think, that uh, it was a privacy screen around a, a, a reception desk. And the question came up, do we use something that's like an opaque material to give some privacy, or do we do something simple like transparent plexi or glass or you know, some, something along those lines? And we said, well, let's go and take a look at it. And we just had it up on the screen in front of him. And uh, in the model, we made the material clear glass. And we all looked at it and thought, I don't know. I don't know if that really works. And we had the idea, let's go ahead and take a look at it in 3D. Let's really see how it feels. And to our astonishment, it actually looked so much better in 3D, mostly because you had the ability to actually kind of tilt your head and move around and really actually experience the, the material itself. And that's something that would have been totally lost. It was totally lost in a 2D capacity. Um, so the ability to have those six degrees of freedom to move around versus even just the anchored of three degrees of freedom, you don't get that same sense of space 
that you would from the ability, like Jeremy said, to actually walk around a little bit or even just move your head around and, and, and get that full sense of 3D uh, aspect to it. And that, that's, again, something, as I said before, had we gone forward with something different, it would have been permitted, installed, and the, the cost would have been paid for, and the money would have been wasted because they would have shown up to their building and say, this is horrible, we hate this, versus, well, we should have just gone with the transparent material. Great. Thank you for sharing that. The last question has nothing to do about your research, but maybe more of the process. And uh, Steve, I think in our prep call, uh, we were talking with you guys just about the Wonder Grant in general as we were prepping for this great presentation, which by the way, I love the video. Thank you for uh, taking us on a journey with you. That was really exciting. <laughs> we, had some um, we, we, are, we have finished up with the 2019 Wonder Grant presentations. The 2019 is behind us. I think there's a lot of people on the call that was 2020 we were behind us, but uh, we're excited about Wonder Grant 2020. As, as an experience, and there's some uh, design firms that are probably on this call and you're like, wow, Wonder Grant seems like a lot, seems like a lot of effort. What was your experience uh, going through the grant? And, and probably more importantly, what, how did that impact your team? Because um, it's a lot of work uh, that you put in. Uh, the, the, the grants are great and I'm sure the money helped fund um, the work that, that, that you guys did, but it's also a lot of effort. And maybe if people are sitting on the call thinking, I'm not sure if I want to participate in this, I'm not sure I'm going to get out of it what I, what I want, what would, what would you share your experience being um, through the Wonder Grant process itself and, and, and what that did to your organization? Yeah, great question. Um, I, I think it, <laughs> in the course of doing a business and running a company, there are many, many times when you're in a meeting and somebody has an idea about what to do on a project and the response from the principal is, look, we don't have the budget and we don't have the time to explore that. We need to get in and get this done. How many times have we heard that? So what Wonder Grant did for us, it allowed us to take something that we were, I'll say at this point in hindsight, we were dabbling with virtual reality and the tools and so forth and using them, maybe using them incorrectly. And it was one of those things, it was one of those moments where I wish we had time to go a little deeper with this to kind of figure it out. Wonder Grant gave us the opportunity to do that. So when the idea was uh, presented to us about the possibility of presenting a, a, a topic to research, it didn't take us very long to come up with the general area we wanted to get into because it's where we were as a firm. We were struggling with this, wanted to do more with it, and knew we were going to have to work it into our workflow. Yes, it was time consuming. Yes, it's an academic effort. Yes, there was research involved in it, but it allowed us to do something we could not normally have done through the normal flow of our work. We would have eventually gotten there, but it would have been years down the road, probably after the wave of software and hardware uh, had de had been developed, we'd be into we would have been into the game late. Okay, that's that's number one. Number two is what did it do to the team? Um, it, it's interesting. Everybody in the office, from principal to um, intern, had input into the content of this. They were part of the focus groups. It just brought everybody together as a team. There aren't many things we do we do in the office where. Everybody gets to work on the same thing. This was one of those opportunities. And for, for us, it just made the team tighter and closer. So if you're out there wondering whether you should take this on, I, I would say do it. it, it uh, submit the application because just the process of submitting the application and coming up with a topic, um, I think, draws a lot out of your staff. Great. Well, Steve, team, you guys were great to work with, and it was it was excellent to see your excitement through this process and to and to watch how your team had changed. I think you were right. Uh, I remember being there when we presented the idea, and I don't even think we hit the front door on the way out, and you guys knew exactly what you were going to focus on. So I'm glad that you followed your your insights and your inspiration, and and you brought something to the uh, as a result that I think is really meaningful, and and hopefully 
helps the greater community. Again, this was all about the greater community and, and how do we encourage the architecture and design community as a whole to just be better and to provide more value to our customers. And I think you, you've done that along with the previous presenters in the previous weeks. So with that, I'm going to say this is a wrap for the, for the 2019 Wonder Grant presentations. Um, refer back to our website. I think that's still a link in the chat. If you want to go back and see previous uh, presentations, you want to see previous research and the research from HPC will be able to be found there too. To, to the point of all the presenters, um, don't just, the, the, the presentation is just a, a skim. It's a highlight of really the deep content that's within the research. So I hope you'll take the time to do that. But uh, Steve, HPC, um, you guys, again, were great. Thank you for your efforts. And I want to thank our audience for attending as well. Um, this was a great time and a great ride. And we look forward to it again next year. So thank you and uh, have a great week. Thanks, Steve.